We're talking about longevity. How, how do you live longer? How do you maintain a disease-free life? You know, and how do you live and love the life that you're living? It's spending more time, quality time. It's doing less and it's not always doing more. A flexibility session feels better than sometimes ever doing anything, like where you just move your body and like stretch it out and open it up. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today suffered a traumatic brain injury that caused him to find his passion in holistic health and fitness. He was a personal trainer at the White House under the Clinton administration and went on to become a celebrity trainer who helped coach and transform some of the world's most influential people, including A-list celebrities, professional athletes, and billionaire businessmen. Recently, he released a book called 22 Ways to Optimal Health and Fitness. And today we got together to discuss New Year fitness goals for busy people, where we cover a number of subjects to help you create and sustain a healthy lifestyle, including what is the most important first step to creating a workout program you're able to stick to, why HIIT training may be one of the least effective ways to exercise for the average person, and what is the most effective dose of exercise to get into great shape, and why are we doing way more than what we need? So please welcome the trainer to the stars, Mr. Steve Jordan. Mr. Steve Jordan. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is my final one of... Uh... Final one of the year, but first one in the, in the new year. So I'm, I'm excited you're kicking this whole thing off. Oh, thank you. I'll save the best for last and start off the new year with a bla- with a splash, right? So yeah. thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So how's your fitness been this year? You uh, you know you kept to your. I've, I've been reading your book and I'm yeah. very very impressed with this. Thank you. Um, are you, are you a, a, a gleaming example of, of what you've written here? Then. Oh uh, well, say? you know me. I think a little on a personal level. That's a <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and for your audience, yes, I practice what I preach, and I've been doing it for a long time. Lifestyle, uh, actually, the principles and ways in the book are ways that I found personally and professionally that I know work. Uh, they worked 25 years ago when I got into the business, and they'll work 25 years from today. They're timeless and ageless, and uh, so yeah, I've been keeping up with my fitness. And but I, you know, I had a, a son uh, six months ago, and it has been more challenging. <laughs> People definitely told me, you know, a, a child will 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 turn your life upside down, and I didn't believe it or couldn't fathom it, and it certainly did. It's been the most challenging six months of my life, but also the most enjoyable and pleasurable. And I'm so grateful and just love that guy so much. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's been challenging, but I, I get it in when I can and I do my best, which is, you know, is so important in, the, in this business, you know, in, in fitness to just do your best. You don't have to be perfect. doesn't have to always look like your best workout, just doing your best. And uh, you kind of take it from there. You zig and zag. Yeah. I, I thought as it's the start of a new year, I, I um reading your book and I was and we're gonna sort of pull some chapters out to talk about, but I, I thought I wanted to kind of frame this as being the sort of new year fitness goals for busy people because okay. you, you've mentioned uh you know, you just had a, a child recently and and people have got businesses and, and it's very easy to I, I think anyway, and a lot of people I talk to, it's very easy to kind of um get into a plan when you don't have a lot going on in your life but when when you have relationships and businesses that you start or get involved in or they get more intense or you have travel schedules which is what people are now doing more or you have children suddenly that perfect life where you had everything in order including your own health goes out of the window and generally it comes towards the end of of, um, of you know it, it comes at the end of your priorities and, and I think um, and we talked about it on on your podcast. Is is ha- you know trying to make um, or not trying using one yeah. of those chapters <laughs> in your book, but actually making it a priority and and using that to uh, I guess drive everything else to make it uh, I, to, yeah to make the rest of your life easier. Yeah, um, a- absolutely. I, you know, you mentioned a few things there uh, that really stand out. Uh, it's Balance, right? Life is a, is a game of balance. Um, I always tell my clients um, that you're playing a game of life. You know, we learned more in the past couple of years during the, uh, the pandemic uh, that health is your wealth and you should prioritize it. <laughs> it's, it should be the number one priority in your life because without that, you have nothing else. So, you know, prioritizing is important and you should put it up there at the top, right? So health first, family um, it's almost like that adage, you know, the, the saying where you put your oxygen mask on you first rather than, you know, putting it on somebody else where people serve everybody else, but they don't do anything for themselves. So you need to do something for yourself 
do that, prioritize that, and then the other places will come in a little bit easier, you might find. It's harder to do the things for everybody else and then put yourself towards the end of the line, and that's, that's always a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, you said try and you caught yourself, and I <laughs> applaud you for that, uh, because language is really important. It's how you use language and your intention on language. Uh, trying, when you try something, you usually don't do it. It's like do or do not, right? As Yoda said. So that is a chapter in this book. And I think it's really important to make sure your language is in sync with your intentions. If you want to prioritize fitness and health and your well being, then you need to act as if, and you need to say it is a priority rather than I'm trying to make it a priority. You have to say it is a priority. And you have to believe it before you can achieve it, another chapter of the book, right? So you have to do that in order to follow through on it. Um, And listen, again, as I said earlier, nothing is perfect. You have to just do your best. And you will fall. It's not how hard you fall. It's how quickly you pick yourself back up. Rather than losing a day or two, let's say losing a two days uh, and working out, make it one day. Or if that's a high standard and maybe too much for you, know, you to ask, or maybe for, maybe for you and I, that's a, an easier standard to follow by. But if it's three days, don't let any more than three days go by without exercising or moving daily or doing something. Then pick yourself back up and get back in the game. Make it a rule. And when you make it a rule, it's less likely you break a rule. You're less likely to break that rule because it's really not intended. We don't like to break rules. I mean, even the baddest person in the you know, world doesn't really enjoy breaking rules. They just got caught up in the habit of doing it. We just got to break that habit. So prioritizing it, using better language, don't try, do, um, you know, and, and put it at the top of your priority. Make health your priority. Set it as a standard, just like you have standards in other areas of your life. Um, you know, if you're dating, you have a certain standard of a, a guy that you like or a girl that you like, or if you have a, a, a car preference, you have a certain standard of car, a certain model or make. Uh, clothing, everything, fitness clothing, the certain gym, like there's, you know, gyms on almost every corner, everywhere you go, but what is one, why does one person like this gym as opposed to this gym? There's a standard, there's a quality of people, there's certain elements inside the atmosphere, the equipment, right, that people like. So set those standards, recognize them, and then do that for yourself and follow through on it. You've had a, an interesting client list, which I wasn't aware, actually. We've known each other for, I know, for a little while. We met, we met this year, actually, through a, for a, yeah, it's, a friend. It's, and, um, but you've had, some, you've had some pretty interesting clients. From, for from for sure, yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit, for, for those of you who don't know, you know, tell us a little bit about the people that you train and some of the, I guess, some of the um, challenges that people that, I guess, most of us would class are at a high level. Mm. Just, just to, I guess, just to almost like relate that, we're all kind of the same when it comes to fitness. Yeah. So I am a trainer to the stars. Um, I have always been really embarrassed to say that uh, because it's kind of silly, uh, you know, but I actually turned it around and I say that because as soon as you think of a star, you think of somebody in Hollywood. And that is true, right? But everybody's a star. We're in this vast world, this big galaxy, and there are billions and trillions and zillions of stars out there. We're all a star. What I help people do is shine brighter. That's what I do. When I say I'm a trainer of the stars, that's what I do. My intention with that name and brand was not at that, but I actually morphed it into that. Um, I was thinking one night after like just a brainstorming idea of branding, um, you know, what could I call myself? You know, this celebrity trainer, this, but everybody's a celebrity trainer, like in LA when you're working there. And again, it doesn't have a cachet anymore. It used to, uh, it used to have a very strong cachet, but today it's almost like, it's actually negative, if you say that, in my opinion, uh, and others' opinion. But when I was thinking of this branding, Trainer to the Stars came to my mind, and I was like going through GoDaddy, and it actually existed, TrainerToTheStars.com. <laughs> and I bought it for like $9.99, and I was like, holy cow, this is just, I'm destined to have this. This was like over 10 years ago. So, uh, you know, with that idea of branding, I came to that realization just because of the kind of clients that I did work with. I got fortunate um, with one client um, when I was in New York. I had uh, my career, my job was in Rockefeller Center. I worked for, at the time, the Sports Club LA. I don't know if you remember that health club. They were the world premier health club, like, 
anywhere. They had the highest standards. Their memberships were really high and very expensive to get into. Uh, the trainers had a very high credibility of their background. They had to have a bachelor's of science degree at a minimum. They had to have certain certifications. So they held themselves to a high standard. Also, the internal education was great. And there's the, 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 the kind of the managing of the whole system. So I was there and I got a client, a celebrity client, if you want to call her that. Her name was Ann Curry. Uh, she was a news anchor for NBC. And uh, it was a, an ex, it's just an awesome experience. What I realized was that, like you had just kind of alluded to, she was just like you or I. There was no difference except she was on the Today Show every morning in front of millions of people that watched her around the country. Um, and that was it. She was genuine. She was nice. She was authentic. She was real. She was respectful. Um, and what I realized in that, with that client is that they were just like everybody else. And I didn't really care who she was or what she did. So I just treated her as that. Well, took that to my career in LA and I got, again, another opportunity to work with somebody, um, actually Seal, the musician. Oh, right. uh, he was getting ready to marry Heidi Klum and they were getting ready to go on their wedding in, in Mexico and I started training Seal. And again, like amazing character, amazing musician, amazing person, you know, just bigger than life. You, need, but you, would, you would do this, but my experience with Ann Curry of just recognizing her as this just as a person, just like you or I, but she had a special, unique talent, something that allowed her to be in front of the camera and speak to millions of people every day on, on, on the Today Show. Just like Seal, being able to perform or, or do music videos or get up in front of, you know, however, 50,000 people at a, at a concert and perform and sing with amazing voice. Um, but he was just like you and I, you know, he would struggle with the same things that you and I or everybody else struggles with, with nutrition, with lifestyle, with sleep, with stress, maybe even magnified because of the lifestyles that they lead and the luxury that they have and or the resources, they're, things are very, uh, you know, they have so much at their advantage that sometimes it's hard to say no. And so, you know, just, I started treating people like that and I almost didn't treat, I'd never treat anybody as a star. And I believe that was sort of a superpower that allowed like him and others to refer me to their friends, acquaintances, and peers in that celebrity world because I treated everybody the same. I never asked for photos with anybody. Like, you know, today everybody's about a photo image, you know, and tagging this person and social media, look at me, you know, and look at me with this person. I never once, I don't have any pictures. And I sometimes regret like that way of being but I also respect that way. I guess the, like I have to. There's no going back. Um, but I never like asked for an autograph. I never asked for their picture. I never asked them to write a testimonial or do a selfie with me or anything like that because I just didn't think it was warranted because I wasn't doing it with my other clients, so why would I do it with them? And I didn't want to treat them or make them feel like I was thinking that they were special or different. I wanted to treat them just like I treated everybody else. And I believe that that was a superpower of me and the ability to kind of get that trust and have that advantage uh, to be able to work with some very big superstars. Um, one that I mentioned in my book, um, Dustin Hoffman, uh, which was an extraordinary experience. Uh, I mean, I, I, it made me laugh because he was... Wasn't he skimping on his home gym? Like, did he really want to spend a lot of money? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I'll tell you that story. It's, it's, there's more detail in the book, but just briefly, uh, we were working out in my fitness studio in LA, which I still own. It's been 16 years, which, as you know, is a, um, is a, is a bragging right. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Especially in, thank you very much. <laughs> Especially in LA. Um, it hasn't come easy. There were many ups and downs. Um, and I actually don't even live and work there anymore. I, I live here in Orange County. Uh, where we're, we're shooting this. And um, I now have more of a virtual business where I do online um, and work with people here in this community. But I have trainers now up there that are actually you know, working with clients that are there. So I have a business for the first time where I'm able to make money and I'm able to serve the community and help other trainers have uh, a bigger and high, better career, so to speak. Um, but he and I were working at my studio and uh, he said, you know, I want to build a gym, home gym. He goes, would you mind coming over and, and checking out my house? I was like, sure. And he goes, well, what are you doing now? And I was like, well, I don't really have anything going on after this. this. He's like, well, let's go. So I jump in his car and it, his car was a Tesla. It was one of the first Tesla. I think it might've been the first Tesla. It was like the Roadster. And he goes, do you like to go fast? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> And he comes out of the parking garage because my studio has valet parking and it's a very secure building. And we come out 
and he says, hold on. And he steps on the gas and I got pinned back to the, to the seat. And I was like, oh my God, I felt like I was on a roller coaster ride. That thing went from zero to 60 in like three seconds. It was a two seater. We get to his house and um, we're, we're going through, you know, just in, in his house. And he's like, well, what do you think I need? And you know, I like to be very conservative for people, like whether you're Dustin Hoffman, who really probably has no spending limits, or you're, you know, somebody who does have a spending limit and a budget. I like to be conservative in what I think people need, because you probably know home gyms usually end up becoming hangers for clothes and an extra room where many people don't use it. So I start people off conservatively, and I just told him some basic things to get. But uh, we then afterwards, he goes, well, are you hungry? And I was like, yeah, I'm hungry. He goes, okay, well, let's go back to the studio and then we'll go and grab some lunch. I'm hanging out with Dustin Hoffman for like a couple of hours now. Besides training, we're just hanging out. So uh, I jump in my car and he goes, how about you drive? And now I've got Dustin Hoffman in my car as a passenger and I'm driving to Toscana's on uh, San Vicente in, in Brentwood <laughs> and sitting down having Italian lunch with Dustin Hoffman and people coming over, the waiters and people know him. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, these are some of the perks in the business. And that was one time I wouldn't say I was starstruck, but I felt elated. And I was super like, this is crazy. I like looked over. I'm like, Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man, is sitting in my car. I'm driving him to lunch. It was so cool. And that's what I liked about him is that he didn't have an entourage. He didn't have security. He didn't have, like some of my other you know, celebrity clients would have security or they were very private or very um, guarded. Mm -hmm. He was very open and very gentle and kind and just, just really authentic. So, and, and most people are. So and that's when you get to know them and you get past their, you know, some of those layers where they do need to be guarded because people will take advantage of them. And, you know, many people will want something from them. And once they trust you, they're just like you or I, normal people. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. With, a, with that type of clientele, obviously looks are a big part because they're on screen, whether you're a musician, it's people snapping and looking at you. So I, I, I understand the need, particularly nowadays, to have that visual appearance. Um, but the other thing that I, I guess goes with that, and I know you've trained billionaire business people and, 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 and you know, not just in the celebrity world, but how are you seeing people that are, I guess, generally classed as the, the, best, of, the best of the best mm. in whatever field? How are they looking at fitness in terms of their own personal performance? So not, not the six pack or, 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 you know, the chisel chest, but the, you know, how, how are they looking at from, okay, I get now how this is, or, or are they getting how that impacts their performance in whatever they do? It's a great question. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I never really thought of it that way, but something came to my mind just instantly. And what I've been seeing over the past two, couple of years, this different trend in from looking good and feeling good to longevity. So longevity is the game that people are playing now. Um, they want to live longer. They, you know, the, the, they want to live to 100 and plus. And that, that is a, a possibility today more than ever. Um, you know, with the, the way that we're able to quantify, uh, gamify, uh, daily, like, look at ways in which we're doing our health, our VO2 max being super important, how many steps we're getting in a day, you know, Apple watches being able to close rings and other wearables as well, looking at our sleep patterns. We're able to really have more data at our fingertips than any doctor has been able to have over the past, I mean, since history, right? To be able to self-diagnose, um, as you just uh, interviewed Paul Check, he said, be your doctor, be your best doctor, right? You want to be your own personal physician looking at your data. Don't put the, your health into somebody else's hands who also needs to go to the gym and work out and exercise. Typically, the people who are trying to you know, promote you to be in better health 
is somebody that also needs it. You gotta take it into your own hands and there's so many ways in doing that today. So longevity is the game that people are playing that I've seen at this high level because they understand, they go to these centers, these uh, conventions, they go to um, these different institutes where people are talking about longevity and living longer and what is going on within that. The, the biohacking communities, the, the, um, the, the science, not just from the outside, but from the inside. What, are we ha- what is going on on a cellular level? Uh, what we can't see is really what will manifest our destiny, right? On the outside, we can see somebody who looks really good, but you wouldn't know as well as I do, Matt. People who sometimes look really good on the outside are not good on the inside. Mm. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a, you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, many times there's people who are really, I want to say sick, but they're not well on the inside, even though they may look good on the outside. We were talking about that yesterday with the lady from Levels, um, and they were saying... Exactly that, you know, like there, there could be a lot of things that are going on in terms of what you're eating and that, that you may think you're doing for the sake of good health and aesthetics when really actually you're, you know, you're, you're creating a lot of big issues. And, 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 it, and it's, I think it's, I don't know what, what your thoughts are, but certainly when I came into the business sort of 25, 30 years ago, it was very much aesthetic. And marketing anybody that was in the business that was really the goal that was the image that was the story it was it was fitness and I I don't know whether it's just because of the people I'm talking to or whether there is this general movement that you know that has shifted and 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 yeah the physical part is is important Mm -hmm. but there seems to be coming more of an awareness of all of these other things some of which you're, you're actually talking about in here and and um I don't think that's necessarily got down to the consumer level, but certainly people that are in business are starting to rethink and reposition themselves. What is it actually that I need to be offering now? Yeah, and that's exactly right. You know, typically the, the, it's, it's a trickle-down effect, right? So the people with means of resources, again, people who are going to these conventions, you and I who are at the, the top of our field, we're the, we're the influencers, if you want to call it influencers, and I, I use that word very loosely. I, I sometimes have challenges with that. But, um, you know, we're the ones that are getting that information and disseminating it and allowing the masses to, to get that, right? So uh, the people that I deal with have that understanding because some of their physicians are very high level. They want to be at the top, and their understanding and education around longevity. Whereas, I mean, look at Dustin Hoffman. He's got to be now in his probably late 80s. You know, and he's still acting, still doing whatever he's doing. I got a client, Mark Damon, who comes to my fitness studio, works with one of my trainers there now, who I've been working with for over a decade. He's a um, a world-renowned producer. He's got Oscars. He's done all this and that. But he's 89 years old, almost (laughs) 90 years old. He drives himself to the studio six days a week to work out because he knows that is the key to living a longer, healthier life, is exercising, moving daily. That's one of his keys, and he needs to do that. Um, And we'll do it until he can. And then if he can't drive down, we'll go to him and make sure that he's getting that movement in. Um, But that's the kind of people, those... The trendsetters, the stand, the people who have the high standards, mm. where it will start to trickle down, and you know the masses will start to hear this and feel it and understand it in years to come. I still think it's very new and innovative. There's a company I just did a retreat at Canyon Ranch uh, about two weeks ago up in Woodside at their location there, and I met a guy there who um, have you ever seen the the solo car, the the car, it's an electric car, it's just one in, one person. Right. They have it at the Century City Mall in L.A. They're like kind of test drive it. He invented that. This guy's a like a bad scientist, super inventor. Um, he created a company called Jevity. And it's about longevity, about knowing what your longevity score is. There's an app for it now that you can buy. I think it's $30 a year. And it syncs with your health app on your iPhone, if you have an iPhone, and also, I think, the uh, Android as well, where it'll track all that information and it gives you a longevity score. And so you can gamify it and they're going to start building in other metrics where you'll be able to get almost like uh, not a Bitcoin, you'll get a Jevity coin that has a value when you hit a certain VO2 max or you do a certain amount of steps or you're consistent a certain amount of day, you'll get some Jevity coins Well, they'll have companies that they have uh, networked with that you can use those Jevity coins, like and buy a t-shirt or you can buy a coffee at, you know, wherever so that you're, ga- you're gamifying and you're getting these things. You can even cash in those for money. Your insurance will go down, your health insurance will go down, but you're being able to create an opportunity for you to not just 
do it, but have tangibles so that you can be rewarded and be just in, inspired and motivated to do more, um, which I think is awesome. You know, it's a super innovative way to keep us thinking about how much longer we want to live. I mean, when you said, I mean, I, I intend to live to 100 years old. I mean, I'm, I'm almost 48. I'll be 48 in February. And, you know, I know you're pretty much around the same age as me. I mean, I think about my lifespan. I'm like, yeah, easily. Like, we, we've got that in, in us, right? There's no possible way that I'm not going to live to 100. I believe it. And if I achieve it, fantastic. And I see more and more people living to that than ever before. And I know that um, you know, you the statistics Gary, are out there. Did you, have you heard of Gary? You must know Gary Brecker. Yeah. So he, I, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, and um, as it relates to age, and apparently he can tell within a very Dana White. I think he was talking to. He can tell within a very tight time span exactly how long you're going to live. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Have you I, heard that? Well, that's the this Jevity app as well. Will give you based on certain metrics what you, they you know this anticipation of what you'll live to. Right now, my Jevity score is 128 years old. Oh wow! Uh, which oh, you're good. Then. Is, is positive. I mean, it's going to <laughs> it'll it'll decrease, right? And it's not an exact science. There's no exact science. I mean, there's a lot of variables. I can walk out of this room right now and get hit by a car, right? Um, God forbid. Oh, no. But the point is, there are many factors that go into it. There's no like one way. But I know that fitness, health, wellness, nutrition, lifestyle, what we're promoting is a guarantee, like you have a 60% chance, I think this is a statistic, this isn't a made up statistic, this isn't something that I'm just thinking and growing out of my head, that you have a better chance of living longer life, disease free, and disease is not just the obvious cancers and heart disease, it's the other diseases that people are plagued with, back pain, uh, hypertension, uh, autoimmune diseases, other things that are robbing our quality of life. And you know the, these are the things that I believe that we are empowered today more than ever, and you need to be motivated now more than ever to do this because life is worth living. And as you know, you read in my story. I mean, I nearly died, and I, I know what it feels like, and we're you know on the brink of life and death to living an extraordinary life. I, I want to live an extraordinary life, and I want everybody else to do that too. So you you got that, and that's the I think it's the first chapter about knowing your why, and yeah. you clearly have a great story, uh, you know, shocking story actually when I when I read it about how you got your why. Um, I hope people don't have to go through that to, to be so able too. to find theirs. But I, I I do sense, and and I'm in the I'm around people that are in the fitness industry. I've been in that place for a long time. So most of the people that. I interact with or speak to on a regular basis are in the business. They're running a business. They're owning a business. Uh, they're working in a business that is there primarily to get people fit and healthy. That's that's all they do. You know, I'm not in the automotive industry or anything. It's the fitness industry. And yeah, um, a huge percentage of people in the industry, which which you're in as well, um, you know, they they don't necessarily walk but walk the talk and and. And I, I was curious to know why, and if, if you think this, which is obviously a, the first chapter for a reason, is if it's because people don't really have that. I, I get how some of the, the, the celebrity, the stars that you talk to, I, I kind of get how they can do it because it's very much connected to their identity and they're in front of cameras, etc. So I kind of get why that can be a why. But what do you, what do you think is the challenge with people getting something that actually serves as leverage for them to do it. Because without that, you, you're getting this kind of, yo, yeah, I'm going to do it for a few weeks and I stop and it's not a priority and life gets in the way and life's more important. How, how, have, how have you seen or what do you think people do, can do to be successful at identifying a why and, and getting something similar to your case, which changes you permanently? Mm. Uh, it's a great question. I would, if, if I, I, you know, I'm going to do my best to answer it. Um, and what I say, don't take this as the, as the, you know, the gospel. It's not the the 100% truth. But what comes to my mind is that people are, they they don't appreciate life or what they have. They 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 take it for granted. And I think that's human nature. I think, I mean, I take things for granted. I'm sure you take things for granted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we take the things that are constant in our life for granted until you all of a sudden almost don't have it, right? It's like 
you may be in a marriage, right? And you may be thinking everything's going along and then your husband or wife says, I want a divorce. And you're like, what? And then you should doing everything you can to, or your, or your boyfriend, girlfriend to try and like save that marriage. All of a sudden it means something to you now. The why is big enough to do whatever it takes to try and save that marriage. Or when you take your, your health for granted and you go see your doctor and your doctor says, I'm sorry, you have stage two cancer and uh, we need to do some chemo and maybe surgery and whatever else. Uh, otherwise, this is going to turn stage three, four, and you're done. Yeah. Uh, well, all of a sudden, I'm saying, whoa, I need to like do something different, change my lifestyle, eat better, you know, and do the things that I know that are going to prevent this in the future, uh, even once you have the surgery. So I think that you know, we are, we're wired, unfortunately, to take things for granted and, um, until we are faced with sometimes the challenge. And so what I, what I like to do is use my story as an inspiration to – turn the light on for people or make people like have that aha moment because it may not. And I hope, like you said, it never was as severe as what I went through, but life does throw you curveballs. I don't care who you are, right? It's unfortunate. Like you're going to have loss in your, in your, in your life, a family member, a loved one, uh, which is inevitable. Um, you might get injured, a car accident or fall and trip and hurt your hip or your neck or whatever it is, or you might have lower back pain. You may be totally normal and healthy and you have lower back pain. Or if you're an athlete and you're playing at a top level and you know, you pull a hamstring or you sprain an ankle or you twist a knee, whatever it is, it looks like these events are going to throw you off your, off your derail you, throw you off your, uh, out of your balance. But when you have a why and you stay consistent with that and you're understanding that this is a long game, not a short game. That's also, I think, another reason. People are, are intrinsically motivated by short-term gains and, and wants and needs, right? We, are, we, are immediate, we want the immediate attention, but we are, we're bad at like the long term, right? It's even like savings, right? Why do I need to put $5 away a day, right? Um, because if you did that in 20 years, you'd have a lot of money in the bank <laughs> and you'd, that cumulative effect. And I believe health is again, a cumulative, uh, is cumulative as well. The more you do today, the better it's going to turn out later on. You're going to show, it's going to show up. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of what ifs and possibilities there. But again, like I said, I think it's, People are, they don't know their whys because they take it for granted. They take their life for granted, their health for granted, and it's always going to be there. Um, they are more, you know, short, short-sighted. They want short, immediate, like, attention gains and, and feelings rather than a long-term benefit. And then I think it's really just, they never, they just, they're not really, they don't work hard. <laughs> people today don't work hard. Last but not least is people don't want to work hard. People want the easy fix. They mm-hmm. want to do what's easy and they want to make things, uh, they, they want to put as little effort in mm-hmm. as for as big as game, for as much gain. And I think, again, that's human nature as well. Um, it's homeostasis. You know, our body does that innately where our body and our bio, biochemistry, we do just enough to maintain. But when we go outside of that, our body gets uncomfortable and our mind gets uncomfortable. And, you know, if you can challenge that, though, on a daily basis, mindset, uh, movement, doing all that, you create a new standard, that new, like, homeostasis where that becomes the norm and that becomes the, the sweet spot where you need to dwell in. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can go higher, sometimes you can go a little lower, but you want to maintain this. It's like, like the ocean. Tides rise, tides fall, but you want to stay somewhere right in the middle. I think you, you hit on something there, and I just made a note now. There was, there was a guy I interviewed a couple of years ago called Jerzy Gregorich. He was a Polish Olympic weightlifting champion, and uh, he wrote a book, and, and essentially it was kind of stoic philosophy, but it, it, his statement was, hard decisions, easy life, easy decisions, hard life. And, mm. and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And in fact, I was thinking about it just a couple of days ago in the shower about cold plunge. And mm-hmm. um, there's a gym not far from here. They've got a, a great cold tank and only a few people use it because mm-hmm. it's painful and it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And a lot of times it's easier just to skip, do the sauna and, and, and leave. And, but what, what, I, what I think with the cold showers, the cold plunge is outside of what it probably does for your body, the benefits of that. I, I, I think in general we have easy lives not not to say life is easy because it's it's definitely not but i think in general everything's kind of convenient and we've got everything online and if we don't really want to put ourselves in an uncomfortable position we don't have to mm-hmm. you know everything's kind of there and and provided for us and and i suppose pushing yourself into a position where you're 
doing hard things. Like I always used to, if I hadn't worked out for a few days, I used to start with legs because it was the most toughest thing to do. Or, I, you know, go, go for a run. But I think trying to train your mind to do hard things and just accept that that's good for you mm. kind of helps to, to, to sort of get you into the, um, the, the mindset of, um, of, of, of that that's normal because exercise however you look at it it's not it, it, it can hurt you know even though you you get like probably you and my myself are conditioned to really enjoy it but for most people it's quite painful and I think that's that seems to be one of the things it's like yeah it's meant to be hard mm-hmm. and you <laughs> it's not meant to be easy yeah and and a pill that you take is easy is probably not going to be the the best thing for you but I don't know whether no, that's I, what I, you I, think it, it resonates with me a hundred percent and I think you're right on I love that quote and I think it's a, a spot on you're you're right it is mindset and that's you know what my book sort of uh, touches on it's a lot this is all a mindset right so when people ask me like how did you change this person Lisa Kudrow how did you change Ashley Green you know what did you do for them how did you do I did exactly what I'm doing for them as I do for you right? There's no difference. What they had is a bigger why. Their purpose was bigger because they had a movie, they had a TV show, they had whatever they needed that was a big why. If they didn't do it, they were going to be fired or there was somebody else like knocking on the producer's door and saying, hey, look at me, I want to get this job and I'm you know, just as good or whatever. So there's a, there's a lot of competition in that space. But people, like, they just don't, like you said, the, their mindset, their why isn't big enough. And if you can train yourself by doing that, and listen, it's all relative. I, I cold plunges, I've, uh, the one Kenyan ranch that I do the retreat at, they have a cold plunge, it's 49 degrees. I did seven minutes, seven and a half minutes was like, holy cow. I thought, I, I like could barely even get out. I was nervous. Like when I got out, I was like, like, oh, I was like slow motion getting out of it. But the first time I did it, it was 30 seconds and I was like out of the water, like I'm never doing that again. But then I like trained myself to get back in and it's all up in here. Mm -hmm. Everything that happens that you do or don't do happens between your ears or doesn't happen between your ears. I believe it's all a mindset. You have to change your mindset and start small, realistic. Be like, if you can't, if you can't run today, walk, right? If you can't run a mile, run a half a mile. If you can't lift weights, use your body weight. If you can't swim, well, then row, whatever it looks like, just change it up. There's so much variety and so many things out there. I mean, your company provides a lot of great equipment, a lot of resources, a lot of variety of that. So, you but know, they're useless unless you but, decide unless to go and pick Absolutely. it up. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's one thing that you said that I want to comment on, and I think it's really important. Again, going back to language, some of that, what we first talked about, you know, painful, right? So, there, understanding psychology, we, we move away from pain and we move towards pleasure. It's a simple like psychology of, of every human being, all the 8 billion people on this planet. We move away from pain and we move towards pleasure. So if we can take pain away from exercise and disassociate it, we can then have a be- we can we can benefit humanity. We can benefit yourself. If you say it's challenging or it, it is uh, you know it's uncomfortable, that's better suited, better well stated for you to manage that because being uncomfortable, you can get comfortable, right? You could put a jacket on if it's, if it's cold out. You, or you could take a jacket off if it's too warm out. Uh, if the uh, exercise is uncomfortable or if it's, the position isn't good, well, then you can change it. You can move. You can change position. You could do a whole different exercise. And there's tons of things out there, a var- variety of things you could do. Um, and if it's challenging, you just have to keep it challenging enough, not to the point of where the next day you can't walk or move, but where you feel like if maybe you, when you stretch or you do move and you kind of like, you know, you look for things, you're like, oh, yeah, I feel this little tightness. My body feels stronger. I move and I just you, – you do that. Mm. You don't want to create pain in exercise. And you want to, by all means, disassociate that word with exercise, movement, well-being altogether. And you'll, you'll be more than halfway onto mm. your, you know, living a great life. And I think that's important. No. Yeah, I, th- I think that's an interesting one. I, I have issues with my back. I have for a while and, and I think you're right you know there's there's the real back pain where I'm like look this is this is really not good and I, and I think that that can also probably when when you're starting be a reason to say well oh, actually, actually exercise isn't good and whether I've whether it's my back whether I have an injury which you get from time to time or whatever I, I think one of the things I've learned because for me if I can't work out then I'm really depressed you mm-hmm. know so it, it, it particularly if it's something to do with my lower body like a break a 
broke broke my toe playing football with the kids on the beach and that. And I was like, damn, you know. And and I think it's I I, I like what you said there because I, I think part of it is okay. Well, I can't work out now for however long, but being able to say, well, how can you move around that? Mm. Okay, what else can I do? Well, I can do all my upper body stuff. Great. Okay, what else can I do for lower body? So I, I think it's I think that philosophy I like because you've got to just try and continuous. There's going to be something that works for you, isn't there? I think. And, Always. And, and and it's it's not okay because I can't do that now. That exercise bucket is closed. It's like no. Well, what are those other things that? can get you into the habit of continuing to do something. Mm-hmm. There's always an option. There's <laughs> always an option. And uh, as you know, my story, like I found options. I've worked pe- with people as, as, you know, obviously the celebrities and professional athletes, but I've also worked with people with handicapped, right. like with literally coming into my studio in a wheelchair. Uh, this one guy I worked with, his name is Sean. He was paralyzed from the waist down from a hockey accident. He just played, he played in high school and then he was playing like in a, a men's league and he got checked into the board broke his neck and paralyzed from the waist down. Um, I had him come out of his wheelchair and like sit on a power plate, which is this whole body vibration tool that I use in my studio, and get vibration on him and start. I had this other girl who had this rare genetic disorder called Machito Joseph disease, and I'd be surprised if anybody knew that because it's a very, very rare condition. And But she had this, and uh, when I got her on the power plate as well, like she had this immediate like sensation of, of euphoria and movement where I, I, it brought tears in my eyes, chills on my, like my hair stood up on end and like chills and I had like tears in my eyes to see how like just in 45 seconds this girl felt because she had the, like, she felt like a new lease on life, that there was a new possibility and hope that she didn't have before. So there's always opportunity, there's always ways, you just gotta be open-minded and just not accept what whatever you're at as your destiny and as your, as, as the place that you're going to be. you got to think about progression. you got to think about, uh, you know, being better today than you were yesterday. Yeah. And that, I think, is so important, having that mindset. Because we all could be better than we were yesterday. I, I think that's, it comes back to psychology. I did a lot of stuff with Tony Robbins, and I, I, and I also did NLP. And I, and I think one of the, I can't remember which person I learned this from, but one of the things that they talked about is a lot of people, when they get a problem in life or business, they generally see one solution or two solutions and I can't remember even if you've got two solutions it's not that that isn't really a solution it's just a dilemma and and what they encourage you to do is to find lots more options because with lots more options you feel free mm. to be able to do something I, I, I know in business a lot of times you can get stuck in all right well what do I do now how do I get out of this and 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 most of the time it's because you're not opening yourself up to many ideas and I, I can't help thinking after what you've said is is that is something that people think about fitness I, I think one thing people think fitness is probably something you have to do in a gym and it revolves running machines or some kind of machine like that where when in real reality it's not and and I and I think that probably prevents people from doing all of the other things like you say walking or body weight stuff that could probably get them in in good condition that maybe they just don't realize is is even you know possible <laughs> yeah i think they don't understand the definition of fitness you know what it means to be fit right so my book is optimal you know 22 ways to optimal health and fitness health is first right that's that's prior to fitness fitness is this you know other thing that you could do where you're able to move your body in ways that are going to be a little more uh, aggressive, so to speak, uh, or maybe a little bit more higher intensity. That is fitness, you know, being able to play with your kids or your grandkids or, you know, have an active life instead of going to a vacation where you're sitting at the pool and drinking pina coladas, you're going on a vacation and climbing a, you know, a mountain or you're riding a, a bike, you know, several miles going on a biking tour with a, a group and seeing, you know, the environment in which you're, which you're dwelling in and, and visiting. I mean, these are, this is what fitness is. And I think some people are, are short-sighted, as you said. You don't have to. And that's, again, another one of the first chapters in the book is just move daily. Mm. It doesn't matter what it is. Go for a walk. I've seen a lot of people, and I'm sure you have too, get in really good shape, have great health by just walking. That's all they do. I mean, if you look at people around the world, I mean, Americans are probably, and I know this is spread out, 
um, and it's gotten it's more different in the past decade. But Americans were really the first to be fitness centric, you know. And, and then now I feel like it's a lot more diverse. Um, and it's a more spread out worldwide. But I do think that more people walk and just are active in their nature, like daily lives than those that exercise in gyms. Mm. Would you agree with that? Is that a true statement? Like, so let me rephrase that. If it, the, so more people just walk you know, daily and move that way than go to gyms or have gym memberships. Mm. There's probably more people that do that basic stuff than going to a gym. And I think yeah. that's something that you say, like where, it, you know, it, going back to your point is, you don't need all that stuff. Mm. It's great to have, it's nice to have, it makes a convenient variety, right? But you don't need it. It could just be just going for a walk, maybe starting around the block, then going around your maybe neighborhood school mm. uh, track, and then you know maybe going on a vacation and you know going for walks in the, in the neighborhoods or places that you're going to visit to see something different that you wouldn't normally see but sitting by a pool and drinking a pina colada. I think that's another point that I'd like to talk about because, um, you know, step counting and 10,000 steps has been around. You know, everybody knows this is a boring story. However, I can't help thinking, and I know this is true certainly for myself, that we're not even really doing that. You know, some days you're on, particularly now, you're on Zooms, meetings, we're sitting down, we're in a coffee shop, we're going to our car, we, you know, we're, we're parking outside the supermarket. We're not moving very much. Right. Even people that are super fit are not moving. Uh, there's, uh, maybe if you live in somewhere like New York or London where you have to catch trains and stuff, those are the exceptions. But I don't think most of us are moving enough. And, and, and also I, I think that... Um, I, I was chatting to a gentleman, a friend the other day that has Parkinson's and, and he was telling me that one of the best things for people with Parkinson's is, is fitness exercise mm. and, and that for them the best way to control a lot of the symptoms is to, is to actually have small uh, sort of like bouts of fitness throughout the day. So probably three times of small things. So you could walk, you could maybe mm. you know, lift something for a, for a few minutes. And, and, and I think when you, part, part of... I guess the issue is is how we look at it. It's almost like comparing it to food. You've got one meal a day where you have to eat everything in that in that one meal, and and then that's it. Whereas maybe, and I don't. You're you're the expert, and it's a question to you really. But do you think that probably going for a, a decent walk in the morning and a decent walk in the evening before bed after you've had some, some something, and then maybe having something very simple like a, a sandbag. Um, that maybe in the morning you just do some basic movement. You know, you do some squats, you do a few deadlifts, and you, and you kind of, you know, maybe you just do three sets of 10 three times a day, which takes you no time, with a nice long walk. Do, do you think that if somebody wasn't really doing a lot or used to go to the gym and don't do it, if, if they incorporated something as simple as that into their life consistently, you know, four or five times a week, do you think that would, have, along with getting their diet in control, do you believe that would, would sort of, you know, really change their health and, and, and wellness? Yeah, I don't think, Matt, I know, right. for sure. I, I absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt that works. Right. And I think that um, I believe, if I'm mistaken, there are statistics and there's, there's research showing that, that short bouts of exercise is more beneficial than one long bout of exercise. So people might think, I gotta go to the gym for an hour. Well, it'd be better if you did four 15 minute workouts a day or movements, that's not, not called a workout because that people are like, I gotta change in my workout clothes every day. Like 15 minutes of movement in a day is better than doing one hour because in that one hour, you know you're not consistent. You're gonna be kind of taking breaks in between. But yeah, there's some research that shows that that short term, like those benefits that you just talked about, the short term uh, movement, Morning, evening, afternoon, before before you move throughout the day, before you know after lunch or after dinner, that will be beneficial to your health, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, and and just as just as I've I've got one of these aura rings and sleeps in your book as well as a chapter, yeah. being important, but it's it's almost like you you think you sleep better than what you do. Yeah, and I certainly know that I feel I probably work out more than I do, although I do track it pretty well. But I think most people think, oh yeah, I, you know, I go to the gym and I'm in there for an hour. Yeah, but how long within that hour you're actually working out? And then, and then what are you doing for the rest of the day? Because there are certain days of the week where I don't go to the gym. And if, I'm, if it's not a weekend when I'm out with the, the children, I look, at my, I look at my sort of movement and I freak out. I'm like, what, what, I've, just, I've done nothing. Mm. And, and I, I, it, it sort of got me thinking, I, 
I've got a you know, small gym at home and stuff. And um, because of my back, I tighten up. So there's a few, when I went to see Paul, there's a few ball exercises that I do with a ball and a kettlebell. Just loosens me up. Um, and then once I start loosening up, I then start feeling as though I want to do a little bit more. And, mm-hmm. and it, it, you just, it just kind of wakes you up and gives you like this shot of, of energy. And I, and I suppose it's, it, it made me think, do we, do we reinvent what fitness should be in people's lives, you know? Mm. And are, is it because of what we think of having to go to a place and do it? Is that limiting getting more people involved in, in you know, some other form of sort of movement and exercise? Yeah, I think you're spot on. And I think, you know, the shift, if there is a shift in that direction, is going to take a while. Um, but I still think there's going to be the purists who want that one-hour gym time. And I love that as well. I'm a yeah. member to a gym, and I love putting in that hour, the hard work. But... I like to also do those little short, frequent things throughout the day. And we learned over the past three years during the pandemic that fitness can be done anywhere. I mean, literally. And we've been doing that. I mean, as you know, my business, I moved down here. I had a gym. I still have my gym in L.A., but I was doing it only there. Now I'm doing virtually. I have clients in Maine, New York, Florida, um, where I'm training them virtually and giving them something, whether it's a half an hour or an hour, on a daily basis where they're feeling great and they're able to get the gains and benefits. I've never met them face-to-face. You know, I have a virtual class that I have that I teach people. I have about seven people in the class that show up or don't. I record it and send it to them, and they do it and track it over time. It's amazing. We can do things today. We have so much more at our fingertips than we ever had before. I don't think we should be so provincial and narrow-minded to be able to think that we've got to go to the gym. we got to add extra time into our day um, to do these things because the time, as you know, is our biggest asset. We don't have a lot of it anymore. We've got to spend more time with family, which we saw in the pandemic as well. People got really appreciative of spending more time with family. We have now hybrid work days where people are going to the office for two or three days and then they're able to stay home and do work from home. And it's because these large companies like Apple and, and, and Google, and they see the value that people have. They're long, the, the, the one, their health, but also their happiness. Right, they're, they're, people are happier. They're better when you're when you're with your tribe, with your family, with your friends, and you're able to spend more time rather than sitting in a car. Even if you're in a car listening to a podcast or you know like we're offering here, it's still time away from you could be with family and loved ones and people that you you care about and care about you and get that you know personal touch. Um, so absolutely, I think it's super important for people to understand that exercise and having good health and fitness and wellness is not about going to a gym. It's also, you know, having those lifestyle choices and I can't keyword there lifestyle and use the two doing those things on a daily basis, being consistent, whether it's 15 minutes is better than nothing. I think that's one thing I want to mention too, where I'm sure you've seen this people, if they don't have the hour or the half hour, they just would rather not do it. Yeah. Right. Myself included. Yeah. Sometimes. It's yeah. like, right. But, but you can get a great, like, 15 minutes, like you feel energized. I was just talking to a gal when I walked in here, she was asking about my book and this and that, you know, and I was telling her kind of briefly what it was about. And, you know, I said about energy, this and that, building energy. She said, what? That's exactly what I need. And she's like, you know, I eat all this bad food around the holidays and I put on some extra weight and this and that and I have no energy. And I'm like, exactly. It's all like fitness, health, well-being, this book, everything that we're talking about is about having better energy and more quality energy. Because mm-hmm. when you have more energy, you have more life. Life is energy. If you break down the definition of life, it's energy. And you don't have yeah. energy, you have no life, literally. So have better energy. If you can do those little short things throughout your day, you're going to increase your energy because even if you're sitting down, if you're standing up on a Zoom call or sitting on a ball, that's just a little bit. you got to get moving a little bit more. Just get out of your comfort zone, as we talked about earlier. Do things that are going to make you kind of shake it up. Well, in your book, you've got a chapter which I think which is called schedule it um and that is also it links to the previous thing which is oh have i got enough time to do it and i know more recently when i've got a lot going on i'll i'll work and then maybe someone's i'm meeting someone for for dinner and i like to when i go to the gym i love the gym and i i you know i'll spend an hour or so working out because I just get into my own zone. And then I'll probably spend an hour, I'll do the, the, the sauna and the plunge and everything. But that's quite a, quite a time commitment. Um, and I do miss it if I can't do it. But there are times where I've, I've got a much shorter time and I need to get, you know, get showered and everything else like that. And one of the things that I've, um, I've, I've sort of challenged myself to think about is, well, even if I've got 10 minutes, what can I do? And sometimes it, it can be a combination of, as I'm busy and I'm also tired. 
And if those two things come together, it's like, okay, well, I'm busy and that's my excuse because I actually feel tired and I don't really want to go in there. So you create a little bit of a reason not, not to do it. Um, but I always feel better if I, if I do do it. So have you got any tips about kind of, even as, as we came back to the beginning, you know, for busy people, mm-hmm. you know, what, what can, if you haven't got a lot of time, and maybe that's going to be the case for sort of three or four days, you know, you've got maybe family coming over or whatever. How have you found to be able to successfully schedule a very, very busy calendar and, and, and sort of get back into that routine? Mm. You know, everybody's different. Everybody's going to have a different schedule. As you mentioned earlier, I've worked with some very, very high-level people, the professionals, uh, businessmen, women who are running companies, who own the companies, the CEOs, who don't have a lot of time, but they prioritize it, right? It's about that priority. And when they commit to something, they follow through on it. So put it, and, and that's, again, human nature, right? When you put it down on paper, it's like a, they say a dream. A dream, a dream is just a goal without writing it down. It's envisioning it and seeing it, which is great. But when you have a goal, you write it down. That becomes realistic and attainable. You now see it and you and you tangibly do it. So when you have a schedule, you can put it in your phone. You can write it down on your calendar. Uh, you can post it on a post-it. Put it on your on your uh, on your refrigerator or somewhere you see it daily. Where you put it in that time, you are less likely to. Uh, omit it or forget it or not do it if it's written down and when you see it. Um, so I definitely employ people to make sure they schedule it. Put it in your calendar, have your assistant or have your wife or husband or your kids like put it in your calendar, put it in your phone, have a reminder, get up, do it, set things around it. Make it as, as, uh, as important as if you had a doctor's appointment, right? I say that to people like if I were your doctor, and you had an appointment with me three times a week, would you blow it off, right? And that's also the benefit of having a coach. And I think that's another thing people should have coaches. You know, when people find out my fees and they, like, they, they pay up front and they're like, wow, that's, you know, that's pricier or this or that. And I said, well, it's also an investment, right? And you're getting what you pay for, but you're also investing in that, uh, the, financial, the financial investment so that you are less likely to cancel on it. So you're less likely to just let it go because if you pay, let's just say hypothetically, one person charges $20, another person charges $50, it's easier to blow the $20 you know, person off than it is the $50. $50 has more value right, than the $20 one. I mean, that's just the way it is. So when you have more financial incentive, there's less reason to do that. Now, if you don't have a coach, I suggest maybe you look for a coach and find one. And you know, there's a lot of coaches out there in some great places, and I'm sure you have some resources for others to find it, uh, to find a coach. But what you can do is maybe make an investment with yourself. So if you put a certain amount of money, let's just say $100 on the, like in a pot at the end of the month, if you hit, you schedule, let's say, three times a week a workout for 30 minutes, and you hit all of those, you take that $100 and you go spend it on something that you love and want to do, like maybe some new fitness clothes or you know, a bag or whatever it is or dinner, whatever you want. Like Just go and do that. But if you don't do it, you have that $100 and you have to give it to somebody, like give it to your kids or you donate it even better to charity. You have to give it away. Give it to something, give it away, not you know, to something good that where it may go to benefit, but outside of yourself. Another way of having a little incentive that I've played around with with some people who who want to kind of play games. People like to play games. They gamify it, right? How do we make this exciting? So doing it that way can be also a, a fun way. So, but absolutely schedule it. Make it a priority. Make it a must. Don't think that also if you miss a day, you can't like get back on track. Mm-hmm. Again, that's my what I was saying earlier. Like sometimes when they miss it, someone misses a day, they're like, oh, I missed a day. You know what? I, I failed. Skip the whole week. Yeah, I, I failed. I'm a failure. I'm, I'm terrible. You know, I can't do it. I knew I wouldn't be able to do this. I, you know, I'm, I, I, I did it. You know, it's just like last year. Well, that's not the case. Listen, be, be kind to yourself. You know, the last year and things that the, the ways that you were before don't have to be the ways that you are now. Again, you got a book here if you want to buy the book, 22 Ways to Optimal Health and Fitness. It's a blueprint, a, a playbook for the rest of your life that you can use to make sure you follow through on. Um, just don't beat yourself up. Be kind to yourself. Love yourself. Make sure that you get yourself back in. And then one last thing is have an accountability partner, per, per partner, person, someone maybe you do it with which would be even better, right? That you share in that commitment and or just someone who's gonna check in with you. Even if it's not a coach that you pay, 
but a friend, a, a relative, a, a husband, a wife, a kid. Just tell them what you're doing. Community, share what your intention is with somebody, and will be let you'll be one less likely to void it because you don't want to you you don't want to let that person down. You want to save face. You don't want to look bad. Again, human nature. And two, you'll feel more responsibility towards somebody else. There's accountability. So that's another great way of making sure that you stay consistent. Um, there's a handful of other ways. Um, and if you know anybody ever had any questions, I'm available. I'd love to you know, offer those. Again, some of them are here in the book. But you can email me at steve at stevejordan.com. I'm happy to answer those questions and just kind of give you a couple tips and tricks and ways that I know that can work. So. What yeah. about, what would you put in that? Like you personally, if, yeah. you've, if you have got that short amount of time, you know, maybe you've got 20 minutes in between other things to, to do something, or maybe you've forgotten or you've left it late. Like what, what would you say for someone who's kind of, you know, reasonably fit is, is the best kind of bang for buck combination of things that you would do in a really short space of time so you don't have to think, oh, I've not got long enough to do a proper workout? Mm. You know, Again, individually specific, um, you know, it's going to be relative. Uh, but what I, what I personally like to do, I always stretch. So people think that you just like exercise, like just means going to lift weights or move your body and like sweat. Stretching is first and foremost before everything. I mean, you're, you're talking about you have back pain, you know, or your periods of that. I had back pain as well. I had back surgery actually 19 years ago, all 5S1, because I didn't stretch. All I did was lift and play sports and kind of break my body down. I didn't do that. I always tell people, look at an athlete. Athletes will not go out and play and do and perform or practice without stretching. And their stretch periods are like 30, 45 minutes before they even go. So stretching for a few minutes, three to five minutes, if I only had 15, 20 minutes is super important. Foam rolling, just static stretching, stretching some of the major muscles like your hips, your hip flexors, uh, your glutes, like your piriformis, uh, your calves, and then your neck and shoulders, like kind of tackles a lot of like areas that we are sometimes very tight. And then I activate muscles. So when muscles are certain muscles are tight, other muscles are going to be weakened. So I turn other muscles on. So I turn my glutes on by doing bridges or clams or uh, hydrants. And then I do other types of core exercises, opposite arm, leg, bird dogs, planks, side planks, turn on these muscles that I want to be active when I start moving. And then I'll just move my body in different planes of motion. I'll do lunges and squats, right? Whether I do them like continuously, maybe 10 uh, reps or 20 reps of a squat, and then I'll do 10 reps of forward back lunges or side lunges. And then I'll do upper body where I'll maybe do some push-ups and then I'll make it a little more dynamic, maybe push-ups with rotation, and then do something for my back, maybe cobras or T's or Y's um, if I don't have any weights um, or I do some rows. And then I go and do that two or three times. Maybe I time it, maybe I don't, maybe I wait some time in between. I don't think HIIT training, uh, high intensity interval training is the way to do it every single time. I think one or two times a week for most individuals is plenty because I think we're stressed enough. High intensity training is high intensity and that creates sometimes more distress in our bodies where we don't need that stress. We need actually movements that are less stressful and more just sort of um, in flow, right? Mm -hmm. So things where you're not breaking your body down, but you're building it up and you're able to coordinate different types of movements, your push, your pulls, your presses, your squats, your rotations, your lunges. I call them primal movements, you mm -hmm. know, and things that we were intended to do, but we're not doing as much anymore. So that may be just on that, that just, yeah. just to jump in there, because yeah, you fired another thought in my mind. <laughs> awesome. The, the, the fitness industry in general, and we, we have one of these locations ourselves, but there's, this, there's been this big trend for HIT, and it's tough. You know, yeah. for our, it's tough to do it on a consistent basis unless you're super fit. Um, and, and over doing my podcast, I've met some great people, scientists, doctors, and, and I, I've been personally very surprised with how little you actually need to do to build muscle, providing you do it correctly. Mm. And there's obviously you know, a separate conversation into how to do that. But I was very surprised with what is, is how little is required to stimulate muscle growth, for example. Um, and then you balance that with the fact that most people's challenge with going to the gym is down to the fact that it's, it's 45 minute to an hour session and it's going to be, we're going to be running on a treadmill and we're going to be pushing sleds. So it almost seems as though like the, the, the solutions that are being provided 
seem to almost like turn people off. And, but even more importantly, they don't necessarily seem to be the best things that you would need to do for, for I guess, general longevity. You talked about stretching. Okay, mm-hmm. well, now I know there's some boutique stretch lab and those types of things that are coming out. Um, for strength training, I don't hear a lot about, and I'm, and I'm sure there are some, but in general, you know, if you look at the, the sort of headlines, I don't see anything that teaches you really a good simple strength program that probably takes 15 to 20 minutes to kind of condition your whole body, which should be possible. And then, you know, some kind of cardio that's not going to leave you in a pool of sweat by absolutely dying at the end of it. There's, I don't see a lot of kind of steady cardio that I do, which, which I get great results with, you know, even, even at my age. And so when I look at what I've done for most of my career, it's outside of my younger days when I used to go crazy on weights, but most of the time I maintain muscle mass. I, I've, you know, got small weight. You can see my abs. So I, I, I seem to have a decent physique and yet I'm not doing what people are pushing. And I, I, I wonder, is it because it's not sexy just to say, look, there's this great new program. It's really boring. You, you don't have to do it very long. <laughs> you do a little bit of weights, you do a little bit of walking, you do a bit of stretching. Is it because it's not cool and sexy or is it, be, or, or what is it? Because you know, tell me what you think about yeah, it. I, th- I think part of it is what you just hit. And, and I, I love that you're going in this direction, having this conversation. Um, yeah, I do think people want that. And I think there's been this glorification of hit training and high intensity and everything today like, has to be harder, faster, more. And it seems to be the, the ideology of what we need to have better results. But I think there's also some of that in our, in our world, in business, where people are working harder, they're, they're doing more, you know, the, the, the devices at our fingertips. I mean, think about a phone. Just 15 years, how much a phone can do. Everything you need is at the fingertips of your phone. And you don't need to do it, but you're working harder, you're working longer days, never turning off, you're always on, like from morning, to, from the time you wake till the time you go to bed, and you're living, you're just living this constant in reaction, more, 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 better, better, better. And even the demands in work are like, you have to be better than the next person. Like there's just always somebody right behind you who's coming up. So I think there's part of the psychology of that as well. And I do believe what you said, like, there is this glorification and the people think that that is, that is what you need. And you are right on. The research is out there that you don't need as much exercise to have that muscle stimulation and muscle, muscle growth. And what is muscle growth? I mean, if you want to be a bodybuilder and you want to perform, and I know you had that you know, experience in one part of your life, you are all in. There's nothing else that you're doing. You're eating and working out. That's it. And that isn't really what most people do. That's a very, very, very small. It's like less than 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the 1% people that actually do that. And that's not necessarily healthy, as we talked about earlier. Um, we're talking about longevity. How, how do you live longer? How do you maintain a disease-free life? You know, and How do you live and love the life that you're living? It's spending more time, quality time, and it's doing less, and it's not always doing more. A flexibility session feels better than sometimes ever doing anything, like where you just move your body and like stretch it out and open it up. I've had clients come into my sessions before and they're like high intensity guys and girls where they're like, this, this, and that. I'm like, how are you feeling today? I always check into somebody. I'm like, how are you feeling today? Stress. I got that. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to warm up. We're going to stretch. And then I try and like move the stretch from five minutes to 10 minutes to 50. They're like, I want to start working out. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> you trust me? Am I your coach? Or are you, or, 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 or you're your like, coach? And they're like, I know, but I want to work out. I want to work out. And I'm like, just trust me. And then I just like ease them in. And then we're doing 15, 20 minutes of stretching. And they're like, <sighs> they're like, I needed that. I feel much better. Like, and then we go into the workout and we have, we have less time working out, more time opening up and stretching and feeling better and just releasing stress, releasing your body. So, you know, to kind of go to your point there, um, yes, you don't need as much as we think we need. Yeah. Um, you know, even th- there's one point as you were talking about that I didn't mention that I'd like to before, we t- we, before I st- stop talking on this topic is rest. Do you know, I'm going to ask you, ask you the question, do you grow when you're working out or do you grow when you're at rest? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, you grow when you're at rest, right? And most people know that, but in case you don't, it's okay if you don't, you grow at rest. You have to rest more to be able to grow. So if you're constantly, and that's why I look at sometimes these HIIT training classes, you know, people are doing barriers, they don't change. They actually gain weight because their body's in this catabolic state where they're not eating enough their body's not nutrient enough, they're stressed out, their adrenal glands are stressed and they're producing too much cortisol and they're actually gaining weight rather than losing weight but they're working out with this, you know, seven days a week, high intensity training at Barry's Bootcamp. Like, 
what's your problem? Like, what's the disconnect here? And it's, you know, again, not making you wrong, not making you feel bad, but there is a disconnect. You're not resting enough because your level of stress in your life, just the example I told you, when clients come in, I'm like, no, you're too stressed. We got to de-stress you. You know, let's take that stress out and let's move. Let's be in flow. Mm. Life is better when you're in flow rather than push, 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 push. You know, what's the um, Newton's law for every action? There's an opposite and equal reaction. Sometimes we push too hard. It's going to get pushed back and your body's going to push back and resist you and you won't see any changes, no. whether it's weight loss or weight or, or, or muscle tone or definition um, or optimal health. Mm. You'll actually reverse that and have less health and less ability to do things you like if you're doing that kind of training all the time. That's why I say one to two times a week. I'm not sure what you believe well, Dorian, in that. Dorian, I interviewed Dorian Yates. Oh, who, man. You know, Dorian Yates is who a, he is. And class, I, classic bodybuilder. I said to Dorian, I said, so we were talking about his training routine, and I'm, I'm going to get this clip cut up again. But I said, look, you know, legs. He's, like, his legs are enormous. I said, so how many times a week are you training your legs? And taught me through the routine. So he, he taught me through his routine, which is on the podcast if anyone wants to listen to it, and it's once a week. I said, once a week to get into that condition? He said, there's no way that you can recover from that type of workout if you're doing it any more than once a week. Now, obviously, he's totally the extreme, you know, like one of the sort of biggest bodybuilders of yeah. all time, you know, a hardcore one. But it, it just made me think, okay, well, you might not want legs like Dorian Yates and most people don't do, but if you just want to actually have some condition and build some basic muscle tone, then probably if you're working hard enough, and I, I interviewed uh, Tony Pearson in Vegas, he took me through a workout again. You know, I was very surprised how not easy it was because he really, was really focusing on the muscle and the contraction and the speed and, and the intensity of it. But I dropped my weight down to almost like half of what I normally did. Um, I slowed the movements down to a lot. And, you know, you can build a, you can build a sort of a, a, a bodybuilding physique doing way less than I think most people really think mm -hmm. you need to combine with, 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 um, with, with good diet. And I, I suppose that's well, why you have to get a good trainer. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's quality over quantity. Right. So but to your point, what you said there, you know, you, there are different variables that you can manipulate to make the quality of the movements and exercise better. Slow it down. The tempo is so important. Right. So slow time under tension is a buzzword today. That means tempo. Slow it down. Feel the muscle. Like we've been doing bicep curls for a long time since we were kids. Right. For probably 40 years. But I know that when you go and do a bicep curl, you can do it better today than you did it yesterday because you just you tweak it, you find some nuance, you find some different way of doing it. It may not just be your hand position, it's just the focus mm. that you have, the intent that you have, the slow, the peak contraction, however you want you know, to kind of do that is great. Reduce the rest periods or increase the rest periods or the load, which is easy, which most people do. They think, you know, I'm gonna lift heavier weights. What I find challenging with the HIIT training is that people go too fast. Mm -hmm. It's all about stimulation. Go, 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 go. They go from one exercise to the next exercise to this, but they don't do any of the exercises good. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing them half ass. And uh, they're not getting the full range. They're not getting full, full range. Yeah. They're going through you know partial range. They want to do it because this person here is a little faster than me or in a little better shape, so I want to keep up with him or her. And you know, it becomes this competition. And you know, look, just slow down, run your own race, you know, like stay in your lane, keep your eyes on the road, like, and your road, do your best. And you don't have to compare yourself to anybody else. Like fitness is a weird, not fitness, the, 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 our industry and people like in, the, in this world can be a weird space, you know, a lot of comparison, a lot of insecurity. People are always, uh, you know, like eyeing you up, you walk into a gym and people are looking you up and down and seeing what you're wearing, what kind of exercise you're doing, you know, like, it, it, it just doesn't matter. Like, just do you. Like, make sure you're doing whatever you can. Be the best that you can. Like, do what's right for you. Don't necessarily do what's right for your neighbor or the person next to you or your friends. Like, pick and choose from some of that, but just do what feels good. That's like, like I think, a, like a overarching theme here is like, do what's best for you and be like, do what feels good, mm. right? Maybe squats doesn't feel good for you, right? I wouldn't, then don't do squats. Maybe do a lunge or, you know, do a, do a leg press or a leg extension. Like they used to say all the time, the leg extension machine is terrible for you because it puts so much stress on your patella tendon and it's not a functional movement. You don't really necessarily do it. But like if that's what feels good and you can't do squats, I'd rather you do that and strengthen your quads and your hip flexors than not do it at all. Mm. So it really just depends on what is best for you. And that's what's so unique and I'm sure you love about this industry 
is that everybody is different. That's why there's no like one like program that anybody has ever done that has been like the you know the the the, the sure thing because there is no sure thing. There's nothing out there that any one person can do or all can do that's going to be the it and forever it. When I say this is your playbook for the rest of your life, it's because this isn't the exercise in here. I don't tell you to go do bicep curls on Monday or triceps on Tuesday or chest press on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. No, I tell you the ways to do and be in your mind, to be in your body, to be in your nutrition and your lifestyle that you can then play the game and choose the plays like you would in a game that are going to be best for you in the situation that you're in. So you're your own like quarterback, you're your own captain of your life and you make the decisions to dictate the way you need to. And if you can hire a coach, hire a coach and then you have more knowledge to interact with that coach rather than that coach just giving you the information. With the book here, you have more awareness and knowledge to be able to have conversation with the coach and say, hey coach, why is that better than this? Or why is this way better? Like asking questions and having dialogue rather than just being uh, you know, just a, a, a person taking the information and going to do it. You think Tom Brady, when the coach tells him to go do this play, and he's like, you know what, coach, I don't think that's the right one in this particular instance. And they have a dialogue back and forth, and then they may come to a, 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 you know, a, an agreement on why one's better than the other, where Tom A. Brady might just say, you know what, I'm not doing that one. It's not the right situation. This, this line is lined up over here and this defensive end is over here, so I'm going to audible and change the play up. You know, that's what you got to do. Life is a game that's constantly changing. And I keep saying life is a game because it is a game. It's like we're playing the game of life and we just got to do the best we can and be our own best captain of our life and be proactive at doing the best that we can with what we have. Where can people get the book then, Steve? Uh, on my website, stevejordan.com. And you could also get it on Amazon. I have it on there on the uh, Audibles, just the ebook as well. Uh, but you can get a hard version, um, autograph it for you um, if you buy it on my website, stevejordan.com. And I actually want to offer people something, uh, being in, the, in the, um, the, the gift of giving during the holiday season, the new year. Uh, if you purchase it uh, in the month of January and it comes through on my site in January, I'll give you two for one. So um, you'll gift it to somebody, give it to somebody you think that might, might value and give it. So yeah, I'll autograph both and send two to you for uh, the month of January. Fantastic. So yeah. last question then, Steve. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you believed is impossible mm. and gone on to make it possible. What would be a recent example of you escaping your own personal limits? Whew. Um, moving, moving down here to Orange County from Los Angeles, where I was residing for almost 19 years and built a, an amazing life business, um, you know, great community of friends and peers. Um, moving is tough, and I moved down here with very little, very little. I mean, I, mean I, I was able to, you know, I had a couple contacts, and, you know, it was just you know, it was daunting, but I wanted to create a better quality of life for myself and for my family and uh, create a family and have a family where Los Angeles and the way that I was living there wasn't conducive to that. Um, we're now, I live in a neighborhood and uh, where we have kids in the neighborhood and we have live on a block now where there's uh, six newborns within the past year. So my son is going to have friends just in the neighborhood, a few doors down and next door. So, you know, that was a big daunting sight because it was a comfort zone, you know, like the comforts. And, um, you know, during COVID, I saw, you know, things shifting and changing um, just personally, my own perspective on life and what I wanted out of it. Uh, the, the business was changing. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to keep my gym or not. Um, so I started to do virtual, which was a, you know, a blessing in disguise. And, um, you know, I came down here with just... Um, you know, just the just the just the opportunity and the possibility of living a better quality of life. And uh, past it's going to be two years. January um, will be you know, and I I'm just grateful. You know, so that was uh, escaping my limits. You know, <laughs> limiting myself to being in LA and having to have a business there and living in that you know space to have uh, also a business that was. <laughs> at a standard that I wanted it at, right? So LA, I moved to LA from New York because LA is the Mecca, or, you know, considered the Mecca of, you know, health and fitness, you know, where a lot of things happen and people are listening to those that live in LA. 
Um, but that's not the case anymore. You know, people are, can do it anywhere now. And so still being able to be relevant, uh, still being able to be an authority, uh, a mentor, a figure of, uh, you know, the pinnacle of this industry, being able to, you know, help people to motivate, inspire, and educate them, um, and being able to live somewhere kind of off the grid and outside of the, the, the nucleus of where our industry is. So, yeah, that's, uh, I think, my most recent escaping limits. And, <laughs> I'm grateful for it every day. Well, thanks again for coming in. Uh, Thanks for the book. Recommend people check that out. It's a great read. Some great tips, even for people that think they know what they're talking about. It's whether whether you're actually doing them, I I think, as well. So, um, yeah, recommend checking this out. Thank Thank you very much for coming over. It's my pleasure, Matt. I appreciate you. I appreciate all that you're doing as well, and uh, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.